Hi, my name is Blue Jay Robinson, and today I'll be covering how to use DIC to measure operational deflection shapes. I'll quickly discuss 3D DIC, what it is, how it works, and VIC3D's system specifications, and how to set up a system. Then I'll show data from two application examples. After that, we'll cover what to do with the data and why it's useful. What is DIC? It's a non-contact measurement method that calculates surface strains and deformations on nearly any surface and nearly any sample. If the sample is visible to cameras and can have a speckle pattern applied to the surface, we can get data. In the top right, we see an impact test being viewed with VIC3D's Iris Graphics Engine. At the bottom right, we see a patch of asphalt with a natural speckle pattern which was used to get data. And in the bottom left, we see NASA's cylindrical rocket shell measuring 27 feet in height that was loaded in compression. The way DIC works is that we have two cameras that have an overlapping field of view synchronously capturing images of a speckle pattern. We can think of the speckle pattern being broken up into a bunch of pixels. If we look at a small group of pixels, which are called subsets, we can think of each subset as having a single data point. If each subset overlaps other surrounding subsets, this is what allows us to get full field data that is typically associated with the DIC method. Data that we get from these subsets is based on how the speckle pattern moves over time and through space. We can also use this technique to calculate curvatures, velocities, and accelerations since we capture images at a steady, predictable frame rate. And you can even generate your own functions using data obtained from external sensors, such as load data or strain gauge data, to find variables not available by default in VIC3D. Currently, low-speed cameras can have up to roughly 30 million points in an image, and high-speed cameras can have up to about 4 million points in an image. We aim to get about 200 images for most dynamic and quasi-static applications, and a few thousand images for vibration analysis. This is all highly dependent on the application, what the user wishes to measure, and desired measurement resolutions. For example, if we take a series of images of a sample undergoing displacement and deformation, we can call the first image in the sequence the reference image. Each subsequent image will be compared to the first reference image to detect motion of the speckle pattern using subsets. We can visualize the overlapping subsets in the reference image so we can measure x, y, and z positions for each point on our sample surface. What we're doing here is measuring the shape of the surface of the sample. If we do the same thing in the deformed images, we can see how the same points move and deform over time. If we subtract the new positions from the original positions, that gives us the displacements and deformations. The 3D surface displacements can then be used to compute the full strain tensor. This has been done for quite some time with low speed cameras. And just like how low speed cameras capture images, high speed cameras allow us to capture images, albeit much more quickly. Obviously, these cameras are more useful for very short duration events. They're typically heavier, larger, and require more robust mounting solutions and are more expensive. While high-speed cameras can currently capture useful data up to about 100,000 frames per second, ultra-high-speed cameras currently capture useful data sets up to about 5 million frames per second. There are some requirements needed for this measurement technique. The cameras need a clear line of sight to the speckle pattern, we need a bright and even lighting across the speckle pattern. We want to capture images at about two and a half times the highest expected frequency, and the test should only last a few seconds at most. If we can get all of these things, the results will show full field color contour plots of 3D operational deflection shapes, which also allow us to extract local velocities and accelerations. In light of the conference's title, The Human Experience of Sound and Vibration, our first application example covers how we used a pair of high-speed cameras to measure the strain, deformation, and operation deflection shapes on a guitar. This was a bit of a tough test because we did not know what frequencies to expect, so we captured 6,000 images at a rate of 6,000 frames per second. We captured images this fast to avoid potential aliasing. With an i7 processor, these images were analyzed in about 45 minutes, and a faster processor will produce data quicker. The great thing about this measurement technology is that we introduced a single excitation, a strum in this case, captured images for a few seconds, then moved on to the post-processing. There was no scanning of the part, multiple excitations weren't necessary, and no equipment needed to be repositioned. This is what the setup looked like for this test. We had the cameras connected to the PC, the high-powered LEDs and cameras pointed at the sample, and the sample has a speckle pattern on its surface. When we provide a turnkey system, along with all of this hardware, we provide calibration grids, lenses, mounting, and a few other accessories. 
After we have a good setup, which involves pointing the cameras at a sample, applying a great speckle pattern, and focusing on the speckle pattern to get a nice, crisp image, calibrating the system involves capturing images of a calibration grid with high tilts about all three axes and place the speckle pattern. Once the system is calibrated, we can run our test, which might involve a chirp, a hammer tap, or a drop, anything that would produce the best input signal. After we capture images of the vibration, the high-speed cameras will have the images stored on their internal memory buffers. So we choose which images we'd like to download from the cameras to the PC, import those images into the VIC-3D system, and analyze them. This allows us to see the shape, displacements, velocities, and strains in the time domain. Once we have that, we can perform the FFT analysis on the time history of the displacements to get the data into the frequency domain. To explain how we go from the time domain to the frequency domain in a bit more detail, I'll use a single point as an example. If we extract a single point in the time domain to find the displacements in the x, y, and z axes, we can see that point's displacement, u, v, and w respectively, over time. Once we have this, if we perform an FFT on the time history of these displacements, we can produce a very high resolution graph of what these points are doing in the frequency domain. We can do this for every point on the sample surface to see the full field operational deflection shapes. Plus, we get acceleration and strain data that we can view in the frequency domain as well. When the FFT analysis was performed on the guitar, we got a bunch of very nice distinct amplitude peaks. Eight are shown here for the sake of brevity. The highest frequency shape produced the smallest amplitude, coming in at only 250 nanometers. So what do we do with this data? By default, the average amplitude is shown in the graph. If we want to investigate a single point's amplitude and phase, we can extract that with a point marker. We can do this for several points and also set any point as a reference to which we can compare the others. In the second application example, we cover a spinning fan for a couple of reasons. One, the geometry is complex, and two, where the constant rotation might present a more traditional measurement technique with some very difficult challenges, it's not any problem at all for the VIC-3D high-speed FFT system. The excitation for this test was simply providing power to the fan from an unpowered state. This allows us to see the run-up effect each time the fan starts spinning. Again, in this example, we didn't know what frequencies to expect, so 2,000 frames were captured at a rate of 6,400 frames per second. In this slide, we see a 3D shape measurement of the fan in the Z direction in the top right, and the 2D data overlay for displacements in the z-direction in the top left. If we extract the average displacement in the z-direction over time, we see the graph at the bottom. We can tell from the data that the fan is wobbling a bit with each cycle and that the fan does have a cyclic out-of-plane motion. When we perform the FFT on this data, we get some really nice looking peaks in the frequency domain that are all between 33 and 560 hertz. This is expected because the fan isn't spinning too quickly. I've highlighted five of these peaks so we can look at them in more detail. Here, we see these five peaks animated in a 2D view with the data overlaid on the image. We've also obtained measurements on many other types of applications. Here, we see a mounted tire, a turbine blade, and a cantilevered beam all being excited with a hammer tap. In the bottom right, we see a mounted model jet being excited by a shaker. So what else can we do with all of this data? The first thing we want to do is pair it with other data from external sensors. Using a BNC connection with a plus or minus 10 volt signal, we can synchronize our images with LDVs, strain gauges, modal hammers, and so on. We can then either import this data into VIC-3D, or we can export the time domain data and frequency domain data from VIC-3D into another program. A standard system cost is usually between $120,000 and $350,000. That should get us about 2,500 frames per second and about 1,000 hertz. Post-processing will be fairly quick, and the strain resolution is about 20 micro strain. Surface geometry usually poses no issues as long as both cameras can get enough pixels across the speckle pattern, and we get a ton of data points. It's all full field. This slide helps to summarize some of the more noteworthy aspects of the VIC-3D high-speed FFT system. We want to provide it as a turnkey system so you'll get all of the software and hardware that you need right out of the box. Our engineers come on site to perform a two-day training seminar, and the system also includes one year of support. Additionally, all of the hardware has a two-year warranty. Future developments for the system include importing accelerometer and or laser data for direct comparison to the VIC-3D data, exporting our data in more formats, 
integrating the FRF into the VIC3D interface, and integrating the FFT measurements into the IRIS workspace. This will allow us to visualize in-plane frequencies more easily and will allow for multiple plots, variables, and DAC data to all be synchronized together in a highly customized, visually friendly manner. To find out more about the patented VIC3D high-speed FFT system, I encourage you to send me an email or just give us a call so we can discuss your application in more detail. Once we know more about your project, we can provide an on-site demonstration of our system. You can also check out our growing online library of DIC training videos and instructional videos at CorrelatedSolutions.com and YouTube. Also, we're really proud of the fact that Correlated Solutions co-founders Hubert Schreier and Michael Sutton authored the book on DIC technology, and a second book is in the works. We've also heavily contributed to the International Digital Image Correlation Society's Good Practices Guide, which is available for free online. Well, that's all I have. Thank you for taking some time with us today, and we look forward to working with you in the future.